Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Parking Council webinar on automated parking garages. This presentation is part of our continuing series of informational webinars to educate the parking community on issues related to sustainable technologies and programs in parking facilities. I am Trevor Mead, Green Parking Council Staff Associate. First off, if you encounter any technical problems during the presentation, please email Paul Wessel at paul at greenparkingcouncil.org or send a chat message to the presenters. Today's presentation is an introduction to automated parking garages. Our goal is that participants will walk away with a knowledge of the benefits realized from building automated parking facilities and an appreciation of the issues that have hindered their ado technology's adoption in the past. Our two presenters will provide us with an overview of automated parking technology, a synopsis of its evolution since the first automated facility was built in the early 1900s, and a case study on Los Angeles's first automated garage, which just opened last month. In addition, our panelists will describe how the sustainability characteristics of automated facilities compare to those of traditional parking structures. Today's expert presenters are Shannon Sanders McDonald, AIA, practicing architect and professor at Southern Illinois University, and Christopher Allen, founder of Dasher Lawless Inc. and Auto Park It. Each presenter will speak for 10 minutes. Please enter any questions you may have into the chat box located on the left-hand side of your screen. We have allotted 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions. The webinar will run no longer than one hour. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Shannon Sanders McDonald. Shannon is an architecture professor at Southern Illinois University and a practicing architect licensed in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Maryland, and Illinois. She is the author of The Parking Garage, Design and Evolution of a Modern Urban Form, which has been published by the Urban Land Institute. As a 1992 graduate of the Yale School of Architecture, she was awarded a Business and Professional Woman Scholarship. Ms. McDonald has written numerous articles on various aspects of parking, architecture, planning, energy, the environment, and transportation. Currently, her work is on new mobility devices, such as automated transit networks and automated vehicles, and how they will transform our urban environment. She has written papers and given presentations at a number of organizations, including the Library of Congress, the Congress for New Urbanism, Advanced Transit Association, the American Institute of Architects, Smithsonian, and the National Transportation Research Board. Shannon? Hi, Trevor. Can you hear me, Trevor? Yep. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to do this webinar. Automated parking has been a very fascinating topic for me ever since I learned about it in researching for the book about the parking garage. It's, a, it's a actually a very old technology um, and dates back in the United States to the early 1920s when we actually constructed automated parking garages, of course using the technology of the day, in many uh, cities and towns across the United States. And there are examples, for example in Chicago, one of those early 1920s structures still exists the center of it that was used for parking uh, is no longer used for parking. So automated parking is when vehicles are parked with, in, in today's world, a computer-controlled motorized device from a drop-off location to a storage area, and no human is in the vehicle. Now, sometimes people think about semi-automated parking as automated parking, but it's not really considered automated parking because it does require a human attendant typically. Some of the newer devices are working in another, dire in another direction. But um, the, a, a semi-automated parking is like the picture you see here. You see this all over New York City. And that they are actually called stackers. And they can go four cars high. Some people have been putting stackers into regular ramp garages to densify parking garage, but they're not officially automated parking. So what is fully automated parking? Well, there are many different types of devices, and what, what clarifies it as a fully automated system is that there are devices for horizontal and vertical movement. 
They can be separate devices. They can be a single device. They can also be circular systems. They can also be something called a Ferris wheel, carousel, rotary lift, and in Europe it's called a postinator, which believe it or not the Westinghouse Corporation in the early 1920s um, created, and it was indeed constructed in the United States and could be found in our cities at that time. And more recently, we're starting to see individual pallets that can move the vehicle in multiple directions. That kind of starting to change the landscape in terms of the discussion of what automated parking is. And so automated parking is not new. The first one was found in Paris, France in 1905. It was designed by a very famous civil engineer and architect, Auguste Perot. And car jockeys were used at the time. But you can see from these pictures that they did have a center tray device that moved horizontally. And they used the elevator to move vertically. Typically, though, pre-1920, the car moved vertically just with an elevator and people in the car driving the car to park it in the garage. However, the technology of fully automated parking did indeed take off mainly in Asian countries. It didn't become very prevalent in the United States, although we did have a period in the 1950s and 60s where we saw automated parking. But it did become prevalent overseas, mainly in Tokyo. And, uh, this is a wonderful photograph of how the Ferris wheel type parking can be integrated into a building. And these can be found all over Tokyo. Now, automated parking, I believe, even though the word sustainable was never used, was always considered a sustainable approach. When you found automated parking, it was constructed so, so that it would be on a very small piece of land. And in the 1950s and 60s, we saw many automated parking garages in small towns, not just large cities. And they created and helped to maintain the small town walkable environment. This is an example of an early one called the Hill Garage from Angeles. Um, uh, one second, please. Shannon, I believe you muted yourself.
Hi, I'm so sorry. For some reason, the line went off, and I'm sorry that you all could not hear me. I hope you can hear me at this time. We can. Thank you. That, great. I, I'm very sorry. don't know what caused that. So this is the Hoboken Garage, and it's an excellent example of being able to integrate automated parking garage into a very dense urban fabric. This is another example in Annapolis, Maryland, and the little entryway that I photographed is actually where the car enters and then is take, taken away and parked underground as a part of Annapolis, Maryland. If you're not familiar with Annapolis, it's the first capital of the United States, and this is an extremely um, small, narrow streets, dense urban fabric, historic city, and integrated parking was added in in a very sensitive way. So at this point, we have had at least 19 automated facilities constructed, ranging from 16 spaces to 409 spaces. We have many, many in the proposal phase, with one listed as having 708 spaces. And this does not include the semi-automatic stackers. So of course, though, the numbers of automated parking facilities found around the world is amazing uh, because they really embrace the technology and they are continuing to be added regularly in Europe, India, Mexico, South America. I was lucky enough to tour and see examples in Tokyo. Uh, this is not a stacker device on the left-hand side. This is a fully automated device as well as another photograph of a um, rotary device which is behind the opening doors near, near the turntable. They use turntables then to allow for very tight um, and small spaces. Also, they have underground parking where you pull off of the highway into basically one spot and then you're, you leave your vehicle and it goes underground. And they have a large underground system of automated garages. This is Rapongi Hills, for those of you that may or may not be familiar with Rapongi Hills in Tokyo, a beautiful, um, a beautiful uh, facility, large hotel, restaurants, it's just a huge complex. This is the entry lobby to the hotel, and if you can see the little white squares at the far end of the photograph, those are all elevator banks for the automated parking or automated parking banks. And literally, there's a glass wall where you see into the hotel lobby. And this is how you enter the facility. Automated parking has the wonderful capabilities of being able to design the lobby or the entry space for the pedestrian in a wonderful way. This is um, an example I thought would be fun to show. I also was lucky to get a tour of automated bicycle facilities. This particular facility is 10 stories tall, and the bikes are hung in a rack-like condition. So automation works for many different applications. So what are the benefits? Hopefully, you've already noticed that the benefits are about land use. And what is amazing, if you look at this chart, is that if you're looking to go underground, low grade, you really are much more cost effective to go automated because now you can, if you were to use to park the same number of cars, you would use far less dirt removal, far less space you'd have to dig out underground. Notice that only the ramp garage above grade, in a very traditional um, garage condition, is the least expensive type of garage to construct. Otherwise, the automated garage can become very competitive. And I want to thank Don Monahan for these statistics. Um, He's done a lot of work in the industry and has been able to compile these statistics. He's showing the operating costs for conventional versus automated. Um, and what he's not calculated here that I think is interesting is the capability to deduct the cost of the actual automated structure itself uh, as, a, as a mechanized device. So this does not include that. So what are the benefits? You park cars densely. You reduce the cubic volume by typically half. Cars are turned off once they enter the parking facility. No vehicles are driving or running. No drivers enter the storage area. 
So lighting and energy costs are at a minimum. There's tremendous safety because that drop-off area, that transfer area like the one I showed you for Rapongi Hills can be designed to be very user-friendly and safe, sometimes designed as a space for community interaction. I just mentioned this earlier. You could use accelerated depreciation because it is a, an actual mechanical device. And for me, the most important part as an architect is you're consolidating parking into compact facilities. And that has implications in many different areas, stormwater control, runoff, a pervious surface, heat ion effect, and in many other issues like designing a park above the great, a ground. So automated parking structures save up to 83% in vehicle fuel emissions. The vehicle is turned off the moment it enters the garage, and it saves a tremendous amount of volatile gases equal to removing 92 cars from the road each year, and these statistics were provided by ARP Engineering. These statistics are from Sam Schwartz, who's done a lot of work in this area in terms of actual emissions data for an automated facility versus a conventional facility. And the benefits for the uh, air and the environment are great, as well as the benefit for fuel use. Because your car is turned off, it's amazing how much less fuel is then consumed. So automated parking assist can assist with meeting lead points and standards. And although standalone garages cannot be LEED certified, automated facilities can be comfortably integrated into buildings, historic and existing urban fabric. And they can assist with meeting any LEED goals you're trying to do. And I'm thinking that automated parking facilities would be appropriate for the new LEED for neighborhood development. I think that would be something very good for people to begin to explore. So if you look at the categories for LEED, you could receive points in every area of, of LEED new construction and LEED new development, depending on how your project is detailed. So what's hindering this? Fire safety. Fire departments are very concerned about the acceptance of the facilities. So are they safe for the firefighters? Uh, have there been equipment standards and testing? How do you ventilate smoke? What are you, use and occupancy issue, issues? You need updated codes, and many local codes are still back in older IBC codes. And I think education about automated parking. Mechanical systems need to be tested and rated. Standalone garages cannot be LEED certified, so that has to be understood. And the conventional ramp garage is still the most cost-effective structure where land is abundant and walkability not particularly desired. So for me, we're going to see a chan changing landscape of urban mobility and eco density. We think about how much land parking covers. The link between land costs and the automobile is, is really paramount. And we're now starting to see new mobility devices and all of these ideas are now merging into new solutions. And I would just let us all understand that infrastructure is our culture, and that although we've been very fascinated with the car moving, it was the car at rest that shaped our living environment. And we're now moving forward. The parking garage, I believe, is still the most important building type and is leading the way to new sustainable vision. So how can we move forward weaving all of these ideas? Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Shannon. Next is Christopher Allen, the president and founder of Dasher Lawless Inc., a development company specializing in mixed use and planned developments. He has spent over 25 years in the building industry and is dedicated to bettering communities through smart development that focuses not only on profit, but community and environmental sensitivity as well. Christopher founded Auto Park at LLC, a firm that develops and implements automated parking technology. He sees tremendous potential for automated parking and looks to bring fully automated green parking systems to communities across the United States. Leveraging his building and planning experience, Christopher is dedicated to revolutionizing the parking industry to minimize its impact on the environment. Christopher, please share with us what inspired you and how it is going. 
Well, thanks, Trevor. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. So I'm a developer based here in Los Angeles, and when you're in an environment as urbanized as Los Angeles is, you have no choice but to look for better ways to develop property. Uh, it becomes harder and harder to assemble property to uh, provide large parking areas. And at the same time, the uh, municipalities are looking to increase densities in specific areas and diminish densities in other areas, which means that you need to change your way of looking at development if you're going to uh, be able to be profitable and find projects that are worth investing and work in a pro forma. One of the things that uh, we specialize here at Dasher Lawless, uh, and I'll explain how that got us to auto park it in a moment, is infill mixed use. Mixed use is kind of like automated parking. It's been around for hundreds of years. If you go back to you know, Rome and London, they've been doing mixed use forever, but somehow it's a new phenomenon here in the last 10 years in the US. Well, it's not. It's just like automated uh, parking. Automation has been around for decades. People have been figuring out you know, mechanized ways, semi-automated ways of parking cars for decades. The technology has been around for decades, but somehow it's brand new technology and uh, educating people like Shannon was speaking about earlier and getting them to buy off on the, on the technology uh, has proven to be a hurdle that is just now um, beginning to be broken down. So when we were looking at developing a, a particular piece of property in Burbank that we had purchased and gotten entitlements for a FAR, which is a floor area ratio of 4 to 1 from the 1.1 .1 to 1 uh, square footage that was allowable by code, uh, we were very excited and, and happy that we were now going to build four times the amount of buildable area. And in the pro forma, it looked great because of rents. The problem was that we couldn't park it. We couldn't park it by code, so we went back to the city, and the city said, you know what, we love the project. It's going to support the movie studios in the area. Just park demand. Uh, we couldn't park demand. Demand was only 113 cars. Code was 212 cars. In order for us to park 113 cars, we were going to be 10 and a half levels deep. Well, on a 12,000 square foot site that's trapezoidal shaped, uh, that wasn't going to be possible, and it was not going to be cost effective. We tried to buy adjacent properties, uh, but the cost of land there is about $500 a square foot, with the average stall size being 340 to 360 square feet. Do the math, it's, it's just not feasible to do. So what we started to do was look at automated parking, the solutions that were out there. I flew all the way to New Zealand in, to meet with you, Park It. Uh, I met with, um, uh, at the time, I think almost every major manufacturer of parking equipment that was out there. We sent our property and our drawings and our structural column grid to a number of different companies who tried to figure out how to integrate into it and work within the structure. We were trying to educate them on uh, the, ne the necessity to interface with a residential user, an office user, and a retail user and the throughput requirements that were going to be different for each and how we needed the cars to be organized so that people who come in using a, a ticket to pick up coffee at the coffee bean uh, needed to have their car at the front so that the transaction time was less versus the employees who come in at 8 o'clock and don't leave until 5, their car can be parked uh, further back in the system. At the same time, trying to discuss seismic codes, fire codes, as Shannon had mentioned earlier, and in Los Angeles, we have some of the strictest building codes and fire codes uh, in the world. None of the companies at the time had been able to get through any of those departments and processes and, and garner any approvals. But for me, there was a bigger hurdle to using the uh, automation that was, uh, that was out there. And that was from a developer standpoint, I'm not looking at the technology. I'm looking at my ability to make a mortgage payment for the next 30 years. Because I was taking and, and had the need for a $3.5 million parking structure, but I was putting a $12 million building above the parking structure. The problem with this, the problem that developers have with automated parking, is seven, eight, nine years from now, when individual components, 
uh, a PLC or encoders on specific motors or whatever it is go bad, how does the new technology that has gone through 20 iterations over 10 years integrate into a system that has old technology in it? How are you going to be able to sustain, and not in an environmentally way, in a, a, a practical manner of making the system work, how are you going to be able to sustain that parking structure and make sure that it works for 30 years so that my tenants can park their cars and that as long as they park their cars, they pay me rent, and then I can pay my mortgage payment and have a profit. The moment the system stops working and they can't park cars in it anymore, they stop paying rent. That's the hurdle for developers. And developers are the um, opening to a grander market than just individual municipalities or uh, an apartment project in New York that can double the number of units and they're selling them for $2 million a piece or Beverly Hills. If we want to make it and stretch it into a mass market, we have to figure out how to be competitive with traditional parking from a cost standpoint, and we have to be able to figure out how to sustain it long term. My solution to sustaining it long term was to not reinvent the wheel, to not develop proprietary technology, but to partner with companies who had already been doing automated storage retrieval systems, uh, automated parking facilities in manufacturing facilities in the industrial applications, and to take that technology and integrate my expertise from a building and development standpoint to form a company that could guarantee developers that we would be able to support the system in perpetuity, that we would be able to uh, design and integrate a system that would be easily uh, um, uh, adaptable to different size projects, customization of different types of, of properties, structural column grids, et cetera, be able to get it approved through LA Fire and other fire departments like we already have, and at the same time be able to sustain it long term. So what we did at Auto Park it was we formed a partnership with Omron uh, Automation and Safety. Omron Automation and Safety has been doing automated storage retrieval systems, uh, manufacturing assembly lines uh, in the automobile industry, uh, et cetera, for 75 years. So we, we have the ability um, to make sure that our technology is keeping up with the different iterations of uh, electric motors, of safety technologies, of sensors technologies, because our partnership with Omron, that's their business as it stands right now. That's what they already do. So what we've done is we've taken them along with DSI. DSI is a group of engineers out of Detroit who have been doing automotive assembly lines for the major manufacturers, the domestic automakers, uh, for more than three decades, have built automated storage facilities in the manufacturing systems that have been operational uh, for decades. We took that group and put it together and formed a company for Auto Park it, called Auto Park it, for developers specifically so that they knew that if we gave them a warranty that it would be good because we've got 75 years of history behind us, that our automation technology has already been tested and tried and true, that our safety technologies are leading in the world, uh, and that our ability to integrate has already been proven with the Chryslers, the Fords, the General Motors out there. We took that and sold it to the city of Los Angeles and said, listen, we understand that the other automated parking companies have been through here and they've, they've come to the fire department. Uh, they've met with Captain Holloway and Captain Holloway asks a dozen questions and, and uh, they get some answers back and don't get other answers back. This is what we do for a living. So we went. The mayor was looking for a pilot program for automated parking to use as, a, as a, a test for automated parking, how it could get integrated into buildings, how the fire department could write codes for it, how the building department could write codes for it. He directed us to Bud Overham, the general manager of, of uh, building and safety. We worked with Bud Overham's office, who brought all of the department heads together from the different uh, um, aspects of um, building and safety, fire, planning, et cetera. And we went through 
uh, all of the plans, systems that, that our partners had already done, how this building was going to integrate parking in, how it was going to work with uh, the residential users, how it would be maintained, et cetera, to help them understand so that they could write new codes and work with us to write new codes for the City of Los Angeles for automated parking. And now we're proud to say that when you go to Building and Safety, they actually have an automated parking checklist for automated parking structures that they never had before because of the pilot program for automated parking. So like any good invention, necessity is the mother. And that was the case for us. We had a specific project that needed automated parking. Uh, we were not happy with the solutions at the time that were out there. And not being too smart a man, I thought, how hard can it be? I'll do it myself. Well, I quickly realized that it was significantly more difficult than, than you would think. But five and a half years later, we've built uh, the first project in the city of Los Angeles, gotten it approved. It's now the um, basis for automated um, codes for building and safety. We have LARR numbers, the Los Angeles Research Report numbers for our equipment and, and uh, both electrical and mechanical. And we've got our hands in about 100 projects across the country. So we had a grand opening a couple of weeks ago. We had the city council uh, members, the uh, state assemblymen, and also the U.S. congressman along with the general manager of Building and Safety, Bud Overham, uh, to kick off the system. And it's been up and operational now for actually for a couple of months. So we're very excited about the opportunities for uh, automated parking. I'll tell you, as a group, we do have work uh, cut out for us, like um, Shannon mentioned about LEED. Standalone parking structures cannot be LEED certified. Well, to me, that's an absurdity. The least environmentally friendly building that is out there is parking, traditional parking structures. If you look at the amount of emissions uh, that are diminished and gasoline consumption, et cetera, I, I would challenge them to compare that to any other building for a difference can what, with what you can do through solar panels, et cetera, with today's technology versus what we can do uh, with automated parking. And I would challenge them that they have to come up with a system that allows standalone parking structures to be LEED certified. Otherwise, they're going to find themselves obsolete like California is determined and develop their own green building codes and federal building codes where, where LEED will no longer be applicable. And I think that if we work together as a group, there is plenty of business for all of us worldwide. And that if we become a cohesive unit, that we can knock down the barriers to market uh, much faster than we could as, as single entities for the benefit of all. That's it for me, Trevor. Thank you, Christopher. I would just like to touch upon that um, last point there regarding certification for standalone parking structures. And the Green Parking Council, that's actually been one of our missions over the past few years, and we're going to be launching a beta certification program this, this coming April. Um, so in, into the questions here, we've received a few. The first is, um, how big is the actual market for automated parking systems currently? Uh, would that be a question for me? Either you or Shannon or both. Okay, well I'll take first shot at it. I can tell you that being in Los Angeles, in the city of Hollywood alone, there's a billion dollars worth of business in the city of Hollywood. If you take that and you expand it and you go, okay, you have the city of Santa Monica, you have the city of Beverly Hills, you have the city of Santa Clarita, and you go on, and then you move that to the city of Los Angeles, you're looking at a handful of cities in one state. And then you go to San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, and you go, okay, this is one state. You got 50 states in the U.S. Now you go to Chicago, you go to Philadelphia, you go to Miami, you go to Denver. This is one country in over 200 countries across the world. Now you look at London, at Venice, at Madrid. The market is infinite. It's a trillion dollar market. And the, the, the only real barrier has been the acceptance of a 
a business model and a solution that works within a developer's pro forma so that they can figure out how to make money on it and guarantee that they can make their mortgage payment over time. If we can figure that out and provide a solution like we believe AutoParket has, the market is infinite. Thanks, Shannon. Do you have anything? I would agree that? because it's, um, when I uh, finished the book that I wrote, which would have been 2006 when it went into final editing, there were many, many uh, projects on the East Coast lined up with automated parking ready to go um, that haven't moved forward. And I just believe, I would agree, totally agree that there's tremendous opportunities here and I believe it will improve our environment and also help with creating more walkable environments um, and in, you know, in some ways helping to reduce car use um, for people. It's a kind of a very interesting symbiotic relationship. I don't think we'll ever reduce the number of cars per se. I think that's going to be always quite a challenge. But the amount that we use them, I think, can be um, very much uh, studied. And with these types of uh, garage facilities, creating more walkable environments uh, would be a, a win for everybody. Uh, just, just one real quick clarification. Sven, I guess, is the one who asked the question. And he's, he, he states in here that he's asking about market size, not market potential. And uh, I would invite him to clarify that because I'm not uh, I'm not sure what the uh, difference in delineation would be. So if he wants to clarify that question, I'd be happy to address it. And I'll address one of the other questions that popped up while Gwen is um, clarifying that for us. There uh, was a question about the cost for uh, maintenance, maintenance for the operating and maintenance costs. Uh, there was a slide. Can I go back, Trevor? Sure. Um, with slides. Um, there was a slide with information provided by Don Moynihan. Now, I would say it's probably different depending on which uh, manufacturer, uh, which system you choose because the systems have different ways that they, many of the different systems that they operate. But um, Don Moynihan did provide a uh, chart where he looked at that. Let me pull that one up. I think I'm now to that chart. It will go up that way, or whether I have to keep doing this. Okay. Um, so this this is, is a little bit old, 2010 data, but this maybe will answer that one question. And then back to the market size question. That question was just clarified. Um, is there any data on? about a rough estimate of how many automated parking systems get built each year? I, I mean, at this point, we started slowly in the United States starting in around 2002. And so it's taken us a while to start to build up steam. But I think it's, you know, we've just heard how quickly it is now moving forward in the Southern California area. Yeah, and in, to further that point and answer Sven's question, I think you're you're probably at uh, somewhere between eight and twelve in the U.S. that are fully automated right now, uh, but we have two projects that are in plan check as we speak. Um, I know that there are several other projects in in plan check uh, here in Southern California. So you're going to see over the next five years at least some of the the major cities become populated with automated structures, and as they're successful. Uh, you, you'll see that snowball. So right now it's only a handful, but in the next 24 months you, you'll see a number of structures that are moving. I mean, we have, we have uh, structures that we're working on, actively working on right now as large as 3,000 stalls. So the market is, is going to become populated uh, fairly quickly as the economy returns. I, I would agree. And when I, I tried to do an update this week in preparation for this talk, and I saw almost 20 facilities that I'm aware of that are fully operational at this point. And uh, follow, uh, the question for Christopher: How, how receptive are the is the development community and builders in the LA region to automated garages? 
Well, they're becoming more and more receptive. I think that they've been looking for the, the, the reason we have our fingers in so many projects right now is because developers understand the need. They understand all of the problems that automated parking will solve for them. Their hesitation has been the sustainability uh, of a system, making sure that it works and that it will continue to work. That has been their scare. And one of the reasons, going back to Sven's question, that, that there haven't been more systems built in the U.S. in the last 10 years is because the initial systems had uh, very well publicized failures, like the Hoboken system as an example. It doesn't benefit any of us uh, to have systems not work as designed. What we need are success stories. And you don't hear about the success stories as much as you hear about the failures. What we have to do is we have to build structures uh, that create success stories that allow other people to not be afraid to use it. Bud Overham, Director of Building and Safety, put it, put it very succinctly uh, why automated structures haven't come to Los Angeles and why the building department has been so opposed to it. He said that Los Angeles does not like to be on the cutting edge of anything because you have a high percentage chance of being bloodied if you do. That's been our downfall in the automated parking business. Now fortunately for me, it's created an opportunity that, that we're taking advantage of. But as we build more structures that are successful, you'll see more people who will go ahead and take that chance. And more importantly, the people who are financing the developers, because developers by nature are a gambling bunch. But the people who finance it and put the money in behind them are not. The more that we can get them comfortable with it, the faster and easier uh, it will be to get automated parking structures built, because they provide all of the solutions that developers need. Thank you. And a little follow-up on that. Were you able to receive financing for the automated structure? Uh, yes, I was. Construction loan and take-out financing both. As far as it seems that codes have been a big issue, has there been anything done recently within the automated parking industry to help make municipalities more aware with issues around building codes and automated parking facilities outside of Los Angeles? Uh, I can answer that question with regard to Southern California uh, and a couple of other municipalities. We've been working with the uh, city councils, the mayors, and the building departments of not just Los Angeles, but the city of Santa Clarita, the city of Beverly Hills, the city of Burbank, the city of Artesia, the city of Long Beach, uh, Laguna Beach, um, the city of Austin, Texas. So we're working actively with uh, the city of Glendale. We're working actively with a number of municipalities, educating them on what we did here in Los Angeles and giving them the political, the, the political powers uh, who want to get the building and safety people on board, giving them the ammunition, the documentation uh, that they need to go ahead and get approvals done in their uh, respective cities. So, so there are a number of municipalities that are already working toward that. The, the, they've been going to conferences on green building that have uh, referenced automated parking, talked about automated parking. When you talk to the planners in different municipalities, they're all for it. They want to try to figure out how to get building and safety and other people to use it. What we need to do is get the cities to incentivize. So we're working here in Los Angeles and at the state level to create opportunities for uh, developers to get additional density, as an example, if they use automated parking, because automated parking is friendly to the environment. Right. So if we can get municipalities to get on board to start offering incentives, uh, much like they do for um, um, other things like affordable housing, et cetera, to do building that's friendly to the environment like automated parking, uh, then that will help speed the, uh, speed the production of automated systems as well. Thank you, Chris. Jim, do you have anything to add on the, the topic of building codes? Well, I, I mean, I know people have been working with the latest IBC codes. I was trying to determine if that had all become effective um, 
in terms of the latest IBC code, and I hadn't been able to verify that 100%. But I know people have been working in those areas. So do you know if the latest IBC code has addressed automated parking? Does anyone know? The latest version? I know that they're working on it, so it should be coming out soon. Um, we just received some information from uh, Frank DeFoe, a participant here, that Don Monahan, um, actually a member of the Green Parking Council and Walker Parking, worked with the National Fire Prevention Association to change standards to allow um, automated parking in 2010. Yeah, in the, yeah in the NFPA updated code. And I, I, I know, I know they, they had also be working, been working with IBC, but I don't know if that, you know, if that, the International Building Code, if that has, um, you know, become more friendly towards automated parking as well. Okay, that's all the questions for today. Um, if you have any additional questions that come up, please forward them on to our two presenters. Just want to touch upon the fact that um, Frank DeFille also had forwarded on some information here that we'll be posting to the GPC website about other uh, successful stories of automated parking. So thank you to our presenters for taking the time to educate us on this topic. The knowledge they have shared has helped the parking industry to gain a greater understanding of automated parking technologies and the opportunity they present for our industry. As of tomorrow morning, this presentation, as well as our panelists' contact information, will be available on the Green Parking Council website. I encourage you to reach out to Shannon or Christopher with any questions that were not answered today. Our next webinar, focusing on Osram Sylvania and its commitment to sustainability, will take place on April 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern. We encourage you to sign up for our newsletter at greenparkingcouncil.org to receive information and updates regarding future webinars. If you have any suggestions for future webinars, please email me at trevor at greenparkingcouncil.org. Thanks for joining us.